say. But, but can I ask you something then? So we have no audience now, right? Yes, we have actually, but on YouTube, we are using uh, Zoom to, to welcome uh, the events. And, oh, okay, okay. Uh, I thought, no, because I thought we could, if it was recorded, I had another suggestion. Okay, no problem. Um, yes, we are in live. <laughs> okay, uh, cool. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to, uh, <clears throat> yeah, happy to, to start with just uh, fixing the slides. All right. Okay. So hi, Carlo. How are you? Fine, thanks. Thanks a lot to be here with us today. So we are going to speak, you are going to speak actually about uh, sensible cities. Uh, just a little context, a little context. So for the release of our Citizen AI notebook, uh, La Charité uh, is organizing a week of events about cities and AI. And so this is the third talk uh, Carlo Ratti, you are the director of the Sensible City Lab uh, at the MIT, which is one of the most famous uh, research labs actually in the world. And uh, today, uh, this talk is about sensible cities and how artificial intelligence can empower sensible cities. Thank you, and uh, thanks a lot, uh, Huber. Um, Beth. Uh, I'll uh, great pleasure to, to, to be here, but when, uh, the reason I was asking before if this was live already or pre-recorded is that I saw that uh, Saskia is speaking in a couple of days. I think we could have maybe changed the format or had a conversation together, but I understand uh, <clears throat> it's live now. So let me share my, uh, my screen and my slides. Uh, here it is. And uh, so, <clears throat> um, I, I will not focus just on artificial intelligence, but I want to share with you a bit of work we're doing on, uh, um, in general, what I would say, urban informatics, but also on a key aspect of that, which is related to cities and to design. And so as, you know, many of you are based in France, I wanted to show you some um, um, visions of the year 2000 um, that were done uh, around the the, the past turn of the century. So these are kind of small artist impressions done in 1899 and 1910 uh, by a number of French artists at the time. And when you look at them, it's interesting. They actually predicted some things right. So they, see, they saw mechanization of uh, farming. This was uh, in the year 2000, they saw that farming would have been increasing mechanized, and, you know, as it is today. Uh, they also kind of uh, saw Roomba, or something that automatically would clean our homes, as you see here. But they also got many things wrong. And uh, if you look at this, this is how they thought we would actually uh, move in the ocean in the year 2000, or they, would, they thought that the police, um, the aviation police would be like this. Uh, and even, uh, you know, in your wildest uh, uh, drone dreams, uh, uh, you, you, know, you don't imagine such scenarios. So because something's right and something's wrong. And uh, that's really because is Karl Popper, you know, the great philosopher, uh, Karl Popper says in the future is open, it's not predetermined. So we cannot predict it except by accident. The possibilities that lie into the future are infinite. And so the future, yes, you know, they got something right a bit by accident, it's a matter of things wrong. So I often, often get the question, you know, can we, can we think about a future city? Can we try to predict it? Well, it's not about predicting. It's more about using design to build the future we, we like. And that's the point that Popper makes in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, many, in, in a lot of his work, in particular in, in the one cited here, <clears throat> the myth of the framework. And, uh, and, and the point is that uh, uh, the future is based on things that still new frameworks and new thinking, new ideas that still are not with us. And so that's why we cannot predict it. Uh, inherently, there's a, there's a lack of information we have today when we try to extrapolate. And so if, again, if you go back to, uh, to the previous uh, visions for the year 2000, you see that you know, they, there was something right, something wrong, but also they missed 
many important things about mobility like uh, Uber or about uh, delivery like Amazon or the internet. You know, just because at the beginning of the 20th century that wasn't in their mindset, uh, that wasn't yet an idea. So um, the important thing then is to look at design. And this is another quote I wanted to, 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 to share with you. It's, about, um, it's from Herbert Simon who wrote a beautiful book about uh, the artificial world and design. The book is called The Sciences or the Artificial. Um, and he says the natural sciences are concerned with how things are designed on how things ought to be. And so somehow design is our way to build the future, to, 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 to design tomorrow's cities. And so I want to share with you how we are taking this idea of design in a lot of the work we're doing at the lab, especially when we explore the convergence of digital and physical, which is um, you know, somehow what is behind the smart or sensible city. For instance, we can look at a city like this today. We couldn't a few decades ago, that's uh, Lisbon mapped using billions of data points collected from the taxi network. That was actually visualization by Pedro Cruz, who was a researcher at our lab at MIT. Uh, and again, it shows you the city like a living organism in an unprecedented way. And if you take the data and analyze it, you can get interesting things. For instance, here you get uh, pickups and drop-offs in, uh, in Manhattan. That's JFK airport, every dot, yellow dot is a pickup, blue dot is a drop off. You can zoom out, you see Manhattan and uh, all of the boroughs before it was JFK down there to, to the right. And, um, and then you can ask yourself different things. You can analyze the data. Uh, for instance, you can ask yourself how many taxi trips could be shared in Manhattan? And if you look at two points like here between uh, two points in Manhattan, you got hundreds of thousands of um, uh, trips connecting them in the course of the year. So again, if you want to answer that question, you need to develop quite a lot of mathematics. We developed this approach called shareability network. Shareability networks, you know, using network science, you see here uh, the, 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 the way we are analyzing different trips. And, um, and then basically what we discover is that in Manhattan, you could take everybody to destination when they need to be there with a small delta, what you see there, the small delay of a few, a few minutes, but with 40% less vehicles than, uh, than what you have, what we have today. An interesting thing is that we started this work before Uber launched Uber Pool. Actually, this work started then a major collaboration between MIT, our lab at MIT and Uber. And as you might know, Uber Pool now, uh, as well as many other similar services that have emerged over the past few years uh, by Didi, by Lyft, by Ola and so on, by Via and so on, uh, really do that, allow two people going more or less in the same direction to share a car, to share the vehicle, which means one less car on the road, which is uh, less uh, congestion, less energy consumption, less pollution in, in our cities. So again, this was a very simple example uh, of how we can use data to better understand the city. We can then ask design questions. In this case, the design question was, you know, well, what could be a different uh, way to look at uh, sharing mobility in the city? and how that you know, can lead us to, to better understand how the city works and how it could be reprogrammed. And then you know, the implementation is something that can happen in different ways. In this case, you know, it happened uh, through a number of industry uh, collaborations. So again, very simple example. And again, the other important thing here, you're talking about AI. Well, AI only works on big data. This is uh, not really AI, but we use a lot of big data analytics. Uh, but somehow it's the same principle. You know, you start from data, you use some kind of intelligence, human or AI to analyze it, to better understand it. And then I would say, you know, you can use, <clears throat> you can try to, to use this technique in order to see how we can change and transform the way our cities work. So anyway, this was just one simple example. Um, there's many others here. In, in this case, for instance, it's another paper uh, from more recent, from a year and a half ago. Um, we called it the minimum fleet problem. Um, and uh, in this case, we looked at different problem, not about sharing the, sharing the car, but about uh, how dispatching could happen better in the city of Manhattan. Uh, or in this um, other piece of research, we, where we looked at all of the sensors on a car. So on a car, you got around 2,000 data sources, and then you can use the car as an ambient sensing platform. By the way, I'm sharing you um, the, the first page of the papers, and you can find all of them on our website if you want. They're 
you can download all of them and look at the mathematics if you're, if you're interested. Um, or the other thing you can do is use the vehicle plus uh, also sensors in our pockets, like in our smartphones, um, in order to monitor the status of the, of the road infrastructure. Uh, in this case, for instance, uh, bridge vibrations and uh, the status of bridge, bridges. So uh, you've all seen images of this. It was a couple of years ago, a bridge in Southern Europe collapsed. You know, many bridges have collapsed in the past. That's uh, it's a common bridge. It happened in the United States a few decades ago. You know, the different type of um, <clears throat> different, many other examples I could, uh, I could uh, mention here, but I wanted to mention one very close to us at MIT. That's Longfellow Bridge in Boston was working okay. Then they did some structural inspections and they realized it was in very, very bad shape. Uh, it was close to collapse. So Longfellow was, uh, was uh, shut down, was basically fully rebuilt at a cost of a few hundred million dollars. Uh, and it also kept the city disconnected for a number of years. And that because it wasn't, it was a monitor. And monitoring, as you see here, on the Golden Gate is very expensive. You put sensors on the bridge, you put cables, fiber, you collect the data, you analyze the data. The cost of monitoring a bridge can be up to half a million dollars per, per year. But now, you know, what you do with sensors is monitor vibrations usually of the bridge. And now we actually have many ways to monitor vibrations. The car has uh, accelerometers inside. Every phone has an accelerometer, as you like those three phones you see there, but also you can look at uh, professional ac accelerometers, like the orange one that you see there on the dashboard. And so we said, you know, can we use this data in order to monitor, monitor the status of our infrastructure? And we started from a very well known bridge that's the, the, the Golden Gate Bridge. And why the Golden Gate? Because it's, uh, it's a bridge that has been studied for many decades by many, many people around the world. So we know everything about it from a structural point of view. And so we got a very good ground truth. So we did this, we started going back and forth across the bridge over a hundred times. After around a hundred times, the San Francisco police stopped us. It got to be suspicious. And by doing this, we collected all the data that you see here is raw data, but then you analyze it, you find really what I was telling you before, we find the main frequencies of vibration of the bridge. And so what we are doing now, we are working again with uh, Uber and also with uh, a large insurance company, Allianz, to collect similar data on a, on a, on a very large scale in many cities and uh, also across a whole European country, and see if we can use this in order to better understand the status of, um, of the road infrastructure we, we have. Uh, the same thing we are doing in, uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We are using both uh, sensors uh, in the car, uh, plus additional sensors we are adding in order to do this, uh, this project, we call it City Scanner, how we can use garbage trucks to scan the city. Here's a short video. And, um, and you know, that led us to, to, to discover a number of interesting things. One of the things we discovered while doing it is actually just with a very limited number of garbage tracks, we could actually get a lot of information from every single corner of Boston, which is quite a, quite a mid-sized city in, uh, in, in, sorry, of Cambridge, which is a mid-sized city in the Boston metropolitan area. And so that led us to ask another, a bunch of other questions. Again, you know, these are related again to a design question. Design question is what is a, how can you design an efficient way to, to sense the city with mobile sensors? And uh, 
and that led us to to analyze uh, uh, the space uh, of uh, well, what we call the sensing power of vehicle fleets. So how the, the space of mobile sensing and you know how effectively you can do it with mobile uh, with mobile vehicles. Uh, that's uh, that's very paper again. You can find it online. Is from from last year. Uh, and the interesting thing is that we found very exciting regularities. Here you see we use a fleets in many cities in San Francisco, New York City, Beijing, Singapore, and so on. And you see that all then follow the same curve. And that curve is very interesting because up to say 0 0.4, 0 0.5 uh, percent, um, sorry, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, so up to 50 percent, um, you can you need a very very small number of uh, of vehicles. And, uh, and what you see here now is basically C is the sensing power, and, uh, and on the x axis, you've got the number of vehicles. With very few vehicles, you can really scan most of the segments in, uh, in a city uh, in a very effective way. So that tells you, gives you a sense of, uh, and clearly, you now then if you want to, to scan everything, uh, in this case, we are not looking, looking at garbage trucks, we're looking at uh, you know, standard vehicles such as taxis or other type of regular mobility. So if you want to scan everything, you, you need larger fleets, but actually just uh, to scan uh, a good chunk, say half of the city, you need just a very small number of vehicles. You see how vertical the curve is at the beginning, which is quite interesting. Uh, you know, just a few sensors and you get a lot of information about our, our urban environment. And, uh, <clears throat> and that, you know, leads to some other work we've been doing about, uh, you know, you saw before in City Scanner, we we're collecting information of different type of sensing different dimensions of the city. Um, and of course, something we've been, we've been scanning for a long time has been air quality. Uh, but then we look at air quality, you certainly want to go and look at it fine grained with mobile sensors, but also you want to look at where people are. You know, you could have a certain distribution of pollution in the city. And the effect of that depends on where people are. Normally, that, that, that analysis is not done. Normally, you just you know, know the pollution condition, and then uh, you know, people don't look dynamically at population to, to really, for instance, for a mayor to take action uh, in, in the city. They ju you just look at the, basically the values you're measuring in different parts of the city by static sensors. So, as you saw a moment ago, I think it's important to use dynamic sensors. You get a fine grained knowledge of the city, but also to look at the mobility of people themselves, because then you can get exposure of people. And again, if you want to, if you want, you can look at the, if you're interested, you, you, I can comment more on this paper, but here we simply match dynamic pollution measures. And we match that with uh, population, dynamic population measures. And we got dynamic population measures using cell phone. So through cell phone, you know where people are and how they move over space. And then you got dynamic uh, pollution measures. And the combination of two is what you really want to, to analyze in order to see where to take action. Because ultimately, you want to minimize exposure to pollutants by humans. And so you need to know that curve, dynamic curve over space and time of pollutants, but also the dynamic knowledge about populations so they can intersect the, the, the two. And again, we see that this, you know, this is something wasn't, that wasn't possible just a few years ago because we didn't have the knowledge to get fine-grained data, neither about neither mobile sensors nor uh, about mobile population, but now we have it, so we can start combining them and uh, in getting a, a better a better uh, knowledge of uh, how to intervene in our cities. Uh, that's another paper related. It's still a, it's still a preprint. I will not comment on uh, on it. Uh, just a few more things, uh, and I'd like to finish a bit earlier and, uh, and then have more time for discussion with you, so I'll try to wrap up within uh, five or six minutes. Uh, you know, if you add additional sensors to the car, uh, like the two little ears at the top, those are LiDAR sensors, LiDAR do a three-dimensional scan of the city, you feed data into an artificial intelligence system and the car drives itself. Now, it's interesting, we've been working a lot on this with our colleagues at uh, CSAIL, with our colleagues in Singapore, with the Future Mobility team. Uh, but we, we are now focusing a lot on the impact of this on the city. For instance, um, you know, today cars uh, are parked 95% of the time. And if you go to a cell driving system, the car can keep on moving, doesn't need to be parked all the time, can give a lift to one person and then another one and then another one. So potentially, we can save a lot, of, we can reclaim a lot of space that now is dedicated to, to parking. So that 95% idle time can be reduced. We, you know, which is a good thing in terms of efficiency of the, the mobility system. 
And that's actually the first paper we did a couple of years ago, looking at um, uh, parking in Singapore. Uh, here you see 1.4 million parking spots. And then if you move to a self-driving system, theoretically, we could uh, reduce those by 70% and reduce them to around 400,000. Uh, and that's uh, the initial paper in I IEEE transaction of ITS. But there's another paper um, I didn't add it, apologies, it just came out last week uh, in Nature Scientific Reports. Uh, came out last week. Uh, you can have a look if you're interested, looking at the same question and trying to find a more generalizable mathematical framework to, uh, to look at this. And again, where we find very similar results. In that case, we actually look at the important trade off. If you uh, clearly, if you go self driving cars, you could go to zero parking, but the cars need to be always on the move. And that certainly is not good because you mean you know you you have many more miles traveled, which means more congestion and so on. So in this paper, we also look at a very simple trade-off, which is increasing miles traveled and you know minimum parking, what we call the minimum parking problem, which has a bound which is based on the increasing miles uh, traveled. And when you look at the curve, however, is very similar to the other one I showed before. The curve actually um, goes uh, uh, down very quickly which means that uh, you could still cut 85% of the parking spaces we have just with a 15% in, 15 increase in total miles traveled. Anyway, I think, again, you know, this in, uh, in scientific reports is, is uh, open access from uh, last week. Uh, and I want to finish with another, uh, uh, some other things. You know, again, these are part of uh, rethinking the city, programming the city. We've been using some AI here as well, deep learning to think about reprogramming, um, reprogramming traffic lights. Uh, but in this case, in this project, we looked at in another approach. So this is not the deep learning research part, uh, but we look at traffic lights and you know, traffic lights arrived on our streets when first cars arrived on our streets around 100 years ago. But if cars become intelligent, they're not intelligent, they know where they are, where everybody else is. You can think about new ways to manage the intersection like this. Don't try it uh, yet. <clears throat> I showed this in, um, uh, in Naples where he told me, so what is new here? Actually, uh, that, that's, uh, I can make such jokes as an Italian, but uh, a former Italian minister once said in Milan, traffic lights and instructions in Rome, their suggestions in Naples, their Christmas decorations. Uh, so, but the interesting thing here is uh, again, how we can reprogram the city and the intersection. And uh, in this paper, you see in a moment, what we did uh, was analyze a real intersection in Singapore. Um, you see it here. Uh, same number of cars arriving to the left and to the right. <clears throat> but to the left, manage using a, the most uh, sophisticated traffic light system we have today, and to the right, manage uh, using a slot based approach. And look at the difference in terms of uh, delay per car and cars waiting to the left and to the right. So, again, how we can bring new intelligence to the city uh, in order to change its behavior. Again, it's a design question, but design question that requires a lot of. Uh, mathematics or analytics or AI in order to be addressed. And, uh, and that's uh, the paper if you're interested. Uh, this actually looks at uh, queuing theory and tries to extend queuing theory to mathematically model the intersection and find a general framework for slot-based systems. Now, um, I think, you know, this is like 25 minutes, so I'll, uh, I'll stop here. I understand we got 10, 15 minutes more. Uh, and I'd be delighted to, to discuss with you. But the bottom line for me was uh, really to, to, to say, if you need to retain two things, I would say the following. The first one is, um, you know, if you go back to Herbert Simon, uh, science looks at how the world is, design looks at how the world could be. And what uh, is exciting today is look at, take a design approach to see how our cities could be different. Could be different uh, because, uh, uh, you know, and sorry, the number one could be different, but it could be different because of second point, uh, which is that today we got a huge amount of data from our cities, you know, big data, thanks to all the sensors we have. And data is the beginning then for analytics, for applying AI and so on. And so we can use new instruments again in order to design, to think about, understand, and design tomorrow's cities. So that's kind of a natural what I want to share with you, and uh, but delighted to have a conversation with, um, uh, with all of you. Thanks a lot, uh, Carlo, Carlo Ratti, for this very dense and interesting uh, presentation. We have a first question about uh, Internet of, na of Nature. 
So uh, you've, you've used Internet of Nature in several, several of, your, of your works. Could you explain what is it and what, is, what are the benefits of this uh, technology? Yeah, not totally. I, I didn't show that we've been doing quite a lot of work and I didn't show it today um, just because of the lack of time, but we're doing quite a lot of work looking at nature in cities. And, uh, and actually, for instance, <clears throat> maybe let me share with you. Well, no, I think it would take too long to, to share it uh, via Zoom. But um, uh, for instance, what we, we've been doing is um, use a lot of images from Google Street View uh, and analyze the images with uh, deep learning with AI and, for instance, do maps of uh, vegetation in cities. So that was the beginning. We call it Treepedia. There's a few papers on that. Initially, we just looked at image processing. Now we're using deep learning to classify the trees. And it becomes a very easy way to do these kind of maps of trees in, in cities all over the world. Interesting thing, actually, is that um, <clears throat> that led us to start a very interesting feedback loop with citizens. We've, we've had so far probably over a thousand people who wrote to us and said, you know, well, you know, can I analyze my neighborhood? Can I compare it with another one? Then they go to the mayor with the data and say, you know, Mr. Mayor, we need to, uh, you know, we need to do something, we need to plant more trees. So somehow it has been a very interesting experiment of how we use uh, a lot of the data, this kind of opportunistic data set collected by Google. We analyze it with, uh, with AI, we, we look at trees, we classify trees, and we use that uh, is in knowledge that can be shared back with citizens so that they can take action. So it becomes this kind of feedback loop with, uh, with citizens. So that was our, the, where we started looking at um, <clears throat> in nature in cities. Uh, we done another project look, looking at biology uh, and we looked at biology in a very small scale. So the project is called Underworlds. Again, I could have shown it today, but uh, because of lack of time, I didn't include it, but uh, you can find it online in Underworld. We went to look at viruses and bacteria in the city. Actually, Underworld, um, Underworld uh, uh, led to a, a successful startup called Biobot. It's very active today to, uh, in the United States, in 300 cities in the United States, looking at uh, um, COVID uh, presence in, in sewage in different cities. And so, so that's how we started blending this world of sensing digital technologies and uh, in nature, uh, in biology, different levels. And, uh, and when you go to the, to, to the internet of nature, really, we started then from that looking at other things. So we've been running competitions uh, using uh, crowd sensing. So asking people, you know, thousands of people across the city to, uh, to send picture and, uh, and map animals that are living with us. But this kind of uh, ecosystem of wild animals living in the city that sometimes that nobody really exactly know. Uh, knows where they are and, uh, and, 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 and match about their... their their existence. So I think leveraging the crowd, we can get a lot of information about that. And, um, and recently also looking at trees uh, from a different point of view, um, which is putting sensors on trees and using, the, using both putting sensors on trees and using the trees as sensors and sharing all the information in, a, in an Internet of Thing framework. So those are some of the work. So this is some of the work we've been doing where we're applying the same, the same approach you saw before, you know, getting collecting data from the city, analyzing the data and creating feedback loops, but we're applying that at digital slash biological systems. We have another question from uh, Daniel Jousselin, which is how could your researches uh, stop people from buying too big over motorized cars as a status symbol? And so maybe another question related to this one could be like, how could we use uh, all your data and knowledges to create walkable cities and uh, yeah, like, like live in cities. <clears throat> yeah, no, thanks. Uh, thanks for a lot of very interesting questions. Um, when you, as I said before, you know, our approach is more like a design approach. And to, for, a, for a design approach, usually what's very interesting is to go and explore different scenarios. So we usually work thinking about lower bound or upper bounds because then we know that the space of reality the space for a city mayor to act upon is in between those extremes. So for instance, you know, the minimum fleet in New York tells you theoretically the minimum number of cars you need in the city to keep, to keep it moving. And then, you know, then reality will be something that's between today and, and that number. So that's, a, that's kind of, um, <clears throat> of our approach. So um, we, 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 we tend to, 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 to look at that as a starting point. And, and you're right, you know, things such as the car is a status symbol, if I understand correctly the question, uh, are things that need to be taken into account, but they're part then of the follow-up discussion and iteration, part of follow-up feedback loops. And what I'm personally, what I'm seeing is in some cultures, 
such as Singapore, for instance, where we, as I mentioned before, we have a lab and we're doing quite a bit of work uh, where the car still is a status symbol. I also see other environments like our own MIT environment where most of the students at MIT today really don't think of the car as a status symbol. Most of the people in our lab who are between 20 and 30 year old, uh, you know, most of them don't have a car and some of them don't even have a driver's, uh, driver's license. So, but those things are all very important. However, the question is, you know, again, how do, how can we enact change in cities? And we see what, as researchers, what we can do is propose, propose different designs or different design ideas, you know, validate them, use mathematics in order to make sure that everything could work. And then the rest should be part of the discussion that can happen in every city, the kind of feedback loop between citizens and the administration to decide on that spectrum where we want to, to land. I also want to add something else that, uh, you know, I talk quite a bit about cars, but um, uh, we're doing a lot of research also on micromobility. Actually, one of our, um, <clears throat> one of the, the first companies that came out of our lab, actually that, uh, <clears throat> that is based initially on a, on a patent we filed around 10 years ago, uh, it's called Super Pedestrian. Super Pedestrian now operates a very large fleet of um, scooters called, uh, you know, the, the brand name for the scooters is called Link. You find it in many cities around the world. I think uh, uh, in Europe, Rome was opened a few weeks ago. Seattle was just one a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so what I want to say is that uh, uh, I didn't, we didn't talk about this, you know, take the example about car is doesn't, doesn't want to show that we are, you know, petrol heads or, or uh, uh, we really believe in cars, you know, it's an example, but we've been working a lot of micromobility, and personally, I think that micromobility uh, in cities has a very big advantage. You don't need to move two tons of steel to, uh, to use the two tons of steel to move like 80 kilos uh, for one or two miles. You can really do it in a much more efficient way with a scooter, with an e-bike, or with micromobility in general. We have another question from Just Rambo. What do you think of the concept of digital twin models to manage infrastructures and cities? Could they, in the end, make the systems more complex to understand and control? <clears throat> Thank you. It's a very interesting. It's a very interesting question. Well, you know, I think when you you are saying making the system more difficult, and probably you are referring to <clears throat> today's digital twins more to the software. You're right. Some of the software we're using today for the digital for digital twins is still a bit cumbersome. But the digital twin is really the basis of anything you can do with um, the city and the AI. You know, AI can only work on data. And so the translation between the city and the AI, the only way you can apply AI to the city is if you turn the city into a digital twin, because a digital twin is basically the city digitized with the, and the city transformed into, into big data. So somehow, you know, I would say there's no escape, uh, you know, and especially if you want to explore the space which is at the core of what you know all the seminars and the webinars of this week which is citizen day AI. there is no way no way out of uh, of this approach but yes yes you know i agree with uh, with you if that's what you mean that some of the software we're using today is still very cumbersome but you know that's always the case think about i don't know the past few i think about something like you know cell phones over the past 10 15 years you know they were very difficult to use at the beginning now Everybody can get a smartphone and an iPhone and start using it, even if you are five-year-old or 95-year-old. So somehow making things, taking technology and making it more easy to use is something that requires a bit of time. And I'm sure it will happen also for digital twins. Last question. Uh, so it's about Big Brother. So how could we create a, um, a sensible city without creating a Big Brother? <clears throat> Great question. Um, I, um, the, the, the theme of data is something we're very concerned about. And actually at MIT, uh, since the beginning at the lab, we actually organized a series of conferences that we called Engaging Data. You know, we had uh, people such as uh, uh, Saskia Sassen, Noam Chomsky. We had uh, several key people from the Obama administration. You know, that was to have a discussion about uh, data and how it should be used. And um, I want to say, some, so, so we're very serious about that. And, uh, and I think that's one of the, the issues we should all be very attentive about. Now, the problem, however, is that the issue today is not much in the city, but the issue is much closer to us. It's in our pockets. Because you know, all of our smartphones are collecting 
thousands and thousands of data points. When we started, when we did the first project ever, back in 2006, we did one of the first projects of the lab. And it was the first time ever that a big city of several million people was mapped using cell phone data. You know, that hadn't been done yet. And still, you know, what now you, you look every day on a Google map uh, with the traffic information is using some of the approaches we developed at the time, you know, in, again, 15 years ago. Well, um, when, um, when you, you look at that, uh, at the time we were collecting for every individual, something like you know, 10 to 20 data points per person per day. And uh, everything was anonymized. And you know, the uncertainty we have for the position of the individual was uh, a few hundred meters. So really, there wasn't like a big uh, um, impact on, uh, on, uh, on privacy. And we, we made sure that everything was very anonymized and so on. So at the time, uh, the impact on privacy we can discuss, of course, you know, if you were to follow one person for a long time, but we were not following individuals, we were anonymizing and aggregating, so there was no issue. Well, now, if you look at what companies do, not universities, but companies, you know, they have not 10 or 20, but uh, probably 1,000 or 10,000 data points for each of us every day. And the accuracy is not 100 meters or 200 meters, but it's more like, you know, one or two. And actually, that's how if you go, if you just, you know, look at, uh, I think, <clears throat> not much in France, I've seen it for a few places in France, but when you Google, like, you know, a bar or a club or a restaurant, uh, Google shows, you know, this is very busy, it's not busy, and usually sometimes it has the real-time information. Well, how do they do it? Because basically, you know, every Android phone that goes inside or outside of the place. And so they can estimate how crowded the place uh, is. And, and that applies to, you know, to each of us and to billions of people on the planet. So that's the situation we're living in today. If you add to that, all the information we're sharing online, on, uh, on Facebook, uh, on all, you know, all the information that we are sharing with Amazon when we're buying things. So somehow it's almost like there's a digital twin of all of our lives and that's beyond the city. The problem is somehow not, is even more insidious. In the city it would be easier to solve, but the problem is close to us, it's in our pockets, is on our computer screens, is, is with all the things we do online with an interface such as this or our computer or, or our tablet. And uh, I think uh, that's uh, I think that's a big issue. It's something we should all be concerned concerned about. And um, again, I don't want to get into the details. There's there's many uh, many possible actions we could discuss. You know, I think there's I think GDPR, the European re legislation from a couple of years ago, goes in a good direction. Uh, I think GDPR is enacting some change. Uh, I think we'll uh, you know I think it's ultimately up to us as citizens to put pressure on politicians to make sure that the world we will live in tomorrow is not a world where a few people know everything about us and we know very little about them. Unfortunately, that is the case today uh, and hopefully we'll still be able to change that direction. But again, is uh, something that's uh, much more pervasive than the city and it's really close to each of us, all of our bodies for billions of people. And it's, it's through the interface we use, inter digital interfaces we use every day. Thanks a lot, uh, Carlo, Carlo Atti, for this webinar. So the, our notebook, Cities of uh, an AI, is freely available uh, in our website. And our next talk will be tomorrow with uh, Philippe Chobareta and Stanislas Chayou. It will be about AI and architecture at 10 AM. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks all. Bye, Carlo.